Half a day. All right. Well, it's my uh, distinct honor and privilege to introduce uh, the 32nd presidential lecturer, uh, Dr. Tom Brislin, who is currently the Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities at the University of Hawaii in Manoa. But, you know, I know him in uh, many different capacities. And uh, more importantly, as you're going to be able to witness this evening, I think, in the course of his remarks, uh, he knows us in a variety of capacities as well. You know, he uh, first came to Guam, uh, uh, and he actually graduated from the, and he was telling me, he didn't graduate from the University of Guam to show you how distinguished and uh, long-standing. He graduated from the College of Guam. That was before it was the university. So he did that in 1968, and he, and uh, then he subsequently followed up, went to grad school at uh, Ohio State University, got an MA in mass communications and a PhD in uh, speech and mass communications as well. Uh, more importantly, I think, is uh, the fact that he had a very uh, distinguished career in, uh, in journalism uh, that uh, was here in Guam. Uh, he's worked at uh, Guam Cable TV. He worked for KUAM News. And he was also associated with a uh, newspaper, uh, well, the Guam, uh, Guam Pacific Daily News, but he also, uh, I first knew him when there was a kind of an afternoon edition of the PDN called the Pacific Dateline. And uh, that was the first time I ever saw my name in print. And uh, he wrote a little column in which I was just kind of mentioned in a glancing fashion. And then I got addicted to, you know, can I see my name more in print? So I started to think, what else could I do in my life to see my name more in print? So uh, he has that relationship. But he's also a very distinguished uh, professor. Uh, when they had the University, uh, the University of Hawaii in their 90th cele celebration, he was one of the 90 professors that was recognized. He's also a 2014 uh, Alumnus of the Year uh, award recipient here uh, from the University of Guam. He has taken on a whole lot of different challenges in, in mass communication, ranging from journalism to taking on issues of uh, uh, indi indigenous aesthetics. He's uh, here really primarily to kind of preside over the film festival that's going on uh, later on this week. So he, he has a, un and he also has a kind of a unique ability. Uh, the way I like to describe him uh, as, a, as a journalist and as a human being, is uh, he tells the truth, and he also understands that he's responsible for telling the truth, which is, you know, that's a, that, you know, you know, it's just one thing to tell the truth, but it's another thing to feel like you're responsible for telling the truth. And he understands the truth, and he understands that truth and facts are not malleable, you know, although there are different perspectives. Uh, he has a healthy respect for indigenous cultures and their view of the world. Uh, he is insightful. He is ethical. He is challenging. He brings a sense of ethical urgency to his work and his words. And that's why uh, I think that uh, they, for us, uh, we're going to find his uh, presentation uh, this evening on confessions of an enemy of the people. And that's what you become an enemy of the people if you're a journalist in today's world. And um, fake, uh, real, and uh, for the rest of us. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Tom Brislin. Afade. And aloha. See if we're, oh, good. You know, I'm, I'm still kind of stunned that I need to take responsibility for Robert Underwood's quest for, for greatness. Uh, gosh, from one, uh, one little column. I do remember the day that he uh, walked into my office uh, in the uh, PDN building. Uh, both of us had more hair. Then his was uh, quite a bit longer, and sometime uh, I need to dig out some some photos of of that particular era. Um, uh, Dean Selman, thanks for the use of the hall. Uh, 
I appreciate it very much. Uh, Ms. Camacho, I was also the president of the Student Government Association uh, at the College of Guam back in, uh, back in those days, and I'm going to go over those days in a, in a few minutes. <clears throat> I also want to comment, I told my dean that I'm going to be a distinguished lecturer at the University of Guam, and I showed him the invitation, and he said, yeah, the 32nd. <laughs> I mean, come on, couldn't you get a higher number than that? Your draft number was higher than that uh, back in the, in the 60s. And I said, yeah, well, I'm, I'm joining a lot of distinguished lecturers, uh, government leaders, uh, the editor of uh, uh, Gift Johnson, the great editor of the uh, Marshall Islands News, and I, I notice uh, also Royce Gracie, to which President Underwood uh, famously said, do you think he could kick my ass? <laughs> and I have to say, number one, treasure a university president that would make that statement. We need more university presidents like that. As it happens, Royce's brother, Relson, is the, uh, the Brazilian uh, version of the sensei for my grandson's uh, jiu-jitsu uh, team. And Relson comes by every once in a while to give the little stripes and the belts for the, for the kids. And so I showed him a picture of Dr. Underwood. And I said, do you think you could kick his ass? And he said, I don't know, but he sure looks like he could kick yours. So <laughs> with that, I think I should, uh, I should get started. Uh, I've, I've titled this Confessions of uh, Enemy of the People. And the reference for that, of course, is uh, President Trump, uh, who claimed that all media are engaged in fake news and that we are, in fact, the enemies of the American people a very troubling statement that I am going to eventually get to. But those of you who know me know I always take a circuitous route uh, to get to a point. I should have been a rabbi, I think, because I love to tell stories. And I think stories are the most important thing that we do as communicators, as professors, as students. We learn so much from stories. In fact, most of our life lessons don't come from a set of statistics. They usually come from stories that we tell to each other. And if we are the, the product of uh, uh, those who are uh, oral-based history, we know that that's how knowledge is passed on, generation to generation. In Hawaii, where I come from, talk story is a, a most important activity. And so that's what I want to, to do this evening. And I want to, first of all, give you a little context. Jesse Jackson once said that text without context is pretext. And I always liked that. Of course, he said it. Text without context is pretext. And I said, well, you're right, you know, there, you can't argue with that. So I want to give you a little context for me and for Dr. Underwood and for Dr. Selman and for a lot of my friends here of our particular generation, where we come from. What were the stories we learned from? How did we become who we are today? Because, let's face it, we were the leading edge of what we call baby boomers. I hope you can read the what time type. Is it, kids? We were the first television generation. Uh, you're a generation that existed without the internet. And you're looking at a younger generation that can't understand, what was your life like without the internet? Well, we go back so far that uh, all we had essentially was radio. We were also the sex. One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Uh, Five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, rock. Nine, 10, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, rock. We're going to rock around. And that was great in the, the 60s. Of course, then we had AIDS, then we had crack, and then we had uh, some of the worst misogynistic uh, music and, and lyrics. Uh, so I'm not sure that that gift 
to our succeeding generations was that great. And uh, that was Dr. Underwood. Our house is a very, very, very fine house. So that's where we are now, uh, getting a, a little closer. But we need to look back a little bit. Order! Miss Order! Order! Comic books, bad. Television, bad. Movies, bad. Because they were afraid. we'd all become juvenile delinquents. Hey, Johnny, what are you rebelling against? What do you got? What do you got? Although we did become great social activists, and I have to commend this generation, social activism has kind of skipped a few generations. But we see it coming out now. I'm, I'm sorry I missed the Retidian protests yesterday right here on campus. That would have been a great thing uh, to come and, and, and see as a revival of interest in, in social media. But when we grew up, our media messages were just a little more uh, benign. <laughs> I'm a robber room doobie, a doobie all day long. Doobie a doobie, and don't be a don't be. Kent, the only cigarette with a micronite filter. Remember, this was Kent the regular, fifth. And the new king size Kent present the story of a man, his home, and his family. Starring Robert Young. And Jane Wyatt. <laughs> With Eleanor Donahue, Billy Gray, and Lauren Chapin in Father Knows Best. We didn't have This Is Us. We didn't have Parenthood. We had Father Knows Best, Ozzie and Harriet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Now some of those values stuck. Family values, the idea of uh, being a doobie, crime doesn't pay. Others, eh, not so much. <laughs> We're living in a society today where for many members of the American community, police definitely are not their friends. And by the way, I should uh, admit I'm something of a dreamer. My great-grandfather was an undocumented alien who came to the United States. I'm quite proud of that. Well, I'm not a crook. Right. This one might strike home a bit. Just and cover. And cover. Can you imagine growing up having to do nuclear bomb evasive drills every day in school? Gosh, sure I'm glad those days are gone. Journalism did come to the rescue, debunking some of those myths that government is all good and good for you. Oh, 
Hold on to that thought because I'm going to show you how science fiction stories definitely affected our generation. And probably what radicalized us the most was indeed our music. Hello, Mary Lou. Goodbye, heart. Sweet Mary Lou, I'm so in love with you. I do, Mary Lou. We never part, so hello, Mary Lou. Goodbye, heart. Wasn't that just clever in there on that slide with the heart? The question I have though, did this lead us to Mary Kay Letourneau, Johnny kissing the teacher? But even Elvis. Love me tender, love me sweet, never let me go. Here's one of the most important lessons that I learned, though, from those early rock and roll stories, was if you had a girlfriend and you had a car, what you wanted to avoid was that railroad line. tracks. The car will stop up on the railroad track. I pulled you out and we were safe. But you went running back. Teen Angel, can you hear me? Teen Angel, can you see me? I to kill off a lot of our teenagers through those cars. Sometimes I wonder, but I'm a corner cure, but there ain't no cure for the summertime blues. Now, later rock and roll, things got just a little heavier. Something happening here But what it is ain't exactly clear There's a man with a gun over there Telling me I got to beware I think it's time we stop, children What's that sound? Everybody look what's going down 1967, there's something happening here. Wow. 
Our preachers preach of evil fates. Teachers teach that knowledge waits can lead to hundred dollar plates. Goodness hides behind its gates. But even the president of the United States sometimes must have to stand naked. Well, I'm not a crook. I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. As Dr. Underwood said, you know, you got to look at both sides uh, without bias. You got Republicans, you got Democrats, they're all doing crazy things. <laughs> walk into this room at your own risk because it leads to the future not a future that will be but one that might be this is not a new world it is simply an extension of what began in the old one it has patterned itself after every dictator who has ever planted the ripping imprint of a boot on the pages of history since the beginning of time it has refinements technological advances and a more sophisticated approach the destruction of human freedom. But like every one of the super states that preceded it, it has one iron rule. Logic is an enemy and truth is a menace. Any state, any entity, any ideology that fails to recognize the worth, the dignity, the rights of man, that state is obsolete. A case to be filed under M for mankind in the Twilight Zone. That was 1961. Wow. That message could take away the cigarette, and that message could uh, go out today. Do you read me? Hello, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Affirmative, Dave. I read you. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Open the pod bay doors, Hal, is a catchphrase of our generation, in case you were, you were wondering. Again, what do we learn from stories? Here's an important one. Time. We finally really did it. You maniacs! You blew it up! Oh, damn you! God damn you all to hell! That's where I'm going. Silent Green is people! We've got to stop them somehow! We learned a lot of lessons from the movies we saw as well. Uh, new cinema, new realism that started in the 70s throughout the 80s. And I'll be talking more about film images as we go along The anti-hero became the hero. And we needed to look inside ourselves to understand many of these films. Get your motor running. Head out on the highway. Many people think Easy Rider was the great hippie story, but it wasn't. It was a morality story. They got their money for their, their trip. They went east, young man, instead of west. But they got the money for their trip from drug dealing, and at the end, they ended up dead. So there was a, there was a lesson to that particular story.
You talking to me? You talking to me? You talking to me? Well, then who the hell else are you talking to? You talking to me? Well, I'm the only one here. Who the fuck do you think you're talking to? Oh, yeah? Huh? Okay. I guess that's the question, isn't it? Have we gotten fooled again? Has, has history, in fact, not changed? I want to pause here for just a moment while we shift gears. That was a, a context. Those were the stories that brought me to where I am today, the stories of my generation. But there's also stories of my own, too, that I would like to relate to you. <laughs> even though some of them may be fake. It's true. There it is. The College of Guam, it actually existed uh, back before the University of Guam. And uh, I was only cum laude. Geez, I wonder what happened there. Maybe I could petition for a, for a higher. Uh, there's my uh, uh, bricks that are right outside the president's office there where I uh, paid some homage to my uh, mentors. Norman, if I can buy a couple more bricks out there, I think I would add some names to it uh, because it wasn't just the professors. It was my fellow students that uh, had a tremendous influence on me uh, as I attended. Uh, I, I was originally going to title this uh, Confessions of a, of a Former Colonialist, but I decided no. I, I won't do that. I'm, uh, I, I hope that I have uh, achieved better status since then. Just in case you're wondering, this is what the campus looked like back then. That's the fine arts building on top, and that's the library on the bottom. They were under construction uh, during that time. So that's, uh, I think you should appreciate the tremendous growth uh, that's happened. What are some of the things I was doing back then? Well, I participated in a lot of the uh, dramatic arts uh, there. Uh, this was, I believe, 1965. Uh, the late, great Patty Jo Hoff was the director of this particular production. But I would just like to ask, uh, who came first with this uh, wardrobe? You know, the Beatles didn't come up with it till 1967. See, I, I promised my wife I'd work the Beatles in, and so here I have. But most importantly, uh, this is where I became a journalist, right here at the, uh, at the College of Guam. And the, I had a column. I wasn't an editor of the paper. I did have a column called Voice of the Pupil. We thought that was pretty clever uh, back then. Perhaps uh, uh, not so much. I did edit the literary magazine. Yes, sir, I was a journalist. That's where it all began. Now, my journalism didn't always impress everyone, but I did get to meet a lot of heroes in life. Uh, that's uh, Brian Wilson of the, of the Beach Boys. That's uh, Smokey of the Bears. That uh, was a lot of fun. And uh, Catherine Deneuve, uh, who was the a thump, a thump, a thump, a thump, the great heartthrob of my generation. Look at that grin on my face there. 
I finally got to meet her. Uh, from Guam, I uh, continued my journalism career in Hawaii. And yes, indeed, I was a journalist. A journalist? Well, what does that mean? Peeking through keyholes, chasing after fire engines, waking people up in the middle of the night to ask them if Hitler's going to start another war, stealing pictures off old ladies? I know all about reporters, Walter. A lot of daffy budinskis running around without a nickel in their pockets. And for what? So a million hired girls, most of them as wise, will know what's going on? Why, I... Oh, what's the use? Walter, you, you wouldn't know what it means to... Well, want to be respectable and live a halfway normal life. Point is, I, I'm through. Well, I was through, too. Uh, I left the uh, newspaper... Uh, the Honolulu Advertiser in 1990 and went back to the university life at uh, the University of Hawaii where I taught journalism. And so one of the things that I taught was the history of journalism. And I do have to admit that fake news isn't exactly new. Uh, there is a history, we have to admit, of, of fake news and we can take it back first of all to the Civil War, uh, one of the most famous Civil War photos. This is Devil's Den uh, from the Battle of Gettysburg. Very dramatic photo. Uh, the problem is it's kind of fake. You start first with uh, Devil's Den, which was empty. Then you find a body and a gun. Then you prop the gun up and say, oh, that's a pretty good picture, but uh, it needs something more. And so then you add the, the body. Uh, this is sometimes attributed to the great Matthew Brady, but it wasn't him. It was another uh, photographer named Gardner. And if you do visit Devil's Den, apparently it's a fun thing to do to recreate that particular uh, pose and have someone uh, take your picture. Now, Matthew Brady, however, was not above <coughs> doing some pre-Photoshop tricks. One general couldn't attend, so he added them in there uh, at, the, at the end. Photoshopping in is uh, a great tradition, as is photoshopping out. Joseph Stalin of uh, Russia was very famous. When someone fell out of favor, they would also fall out of the photographs of him. Uh, we would rewrite history. Benito Mussolini, uh, he wanted a very heroic pose. But let's face it, the guy holding the horse uh, doesn't make it very heroic, uh, nor does the bird that's flying up there on the side. So we'll just get rid of him, and now we look like we're a, a real hero. Sometimes uh, these Photoshop tricks, and these were all darkroom tricks, these were not done digitally at all, uh, are done for uh, sometimes aesthetic reasons in the Kent State uh, massacre photo that uh, unfortunately there was a fence post there that looked like it was sticking right out of the head <clears throat> of the mourning uh, student. So that was eliminated for publication. And then also, here we go with the Beatles again, notice the cigarette there in Paul McCartney's uh, hand that was deemed and not such a good idea for the American teenagers, so we got rid of uh, Paul's cigarette. Most of the time when we talk about fake news, we look at the tabloid era of journalism, the National Enquirer, the Weekly World News, that was very famous for, in fact, making up stories. The National Enquirer were brilliant, in fact. They would want to show that they were legitimate journalists so they would create these uh, foundations, uh, the foundation for clean kidneys or something like that. And then the foundation would give the National Enquirer an award so that they could publish, we're award winners, and of course they were just money laundering that award back to themselves. Some of my favorite stories, uh, the Weekly World News was famous for its space alien who managed to get involved with lots of American leaders. <clears throat> and what amazed me, 
not so much that he, he spent some steamy nights with Hillary, but that he actually wrote a book uh, about it as well. And I've tried to find this book, but I haven't been able to. Uh, Bill wasn't very happy about that, and uh, the alien did end up in jail after he got into a fight with Bill. I love the black eye up there. Oh, poor, poor Bill Clinton. But Hillary, uh, being the woman of character that she is, did adopt uh, the alien baby. So the story did have a happy ending. Uh, I also include the, the photo on uh, Bat Boy there. Whenever I went to the supermarket, I would always pick the longest checkout line I could, just so that I could take the tabloids and read them while I was checking out. And the clerk would say, are you buying that? And I'd go, oh, no, of course not. I'm going to buy that. But I did enjoy reading it. However, once we get out of just kind of the humorous stage and into fake news as deception, then things become much more of a problem. You switched those assignment slips, didn't you? Well, I, I thought reporters always did things like that. At least they do in the movies. And besides, it says write in my textbook on journalism that a newspaper man or woman must stop at nothing to get news. And if she ever intends to impress the editor, she must be willing to do much more than just what the assignment calls for. So there. But what if you can get in? It's still illegal. Not for a reporter. A reporter has the right to do things an ordinary person shouldn't. Ah, oh, fool. Now go ahead and do just exactly as I told you. Oh. You don't understand, Sergeant Entwistle. That story isn't true. Must be true. It's printed in the paper. Nancy just made it up. What they printed for it isn't true. That's the trouble with the newspapers these days. So the history of considering the press being fake, uh, printing phony movies, was known in popular uh, media as, as well. So it's a reputation that can be difficult uh, to overcome. A couple more uh, recent examples. Uh, this famous photo, of course, Jane Fonda was much hated by the right wing for her uh, affiliation, her affinity for North Vietnam during the Vietnam War. And uh, John Kerry, who was running for president uh, some years back, was uh, a member of the Vietnam veterans against the war. And so they took a photo that pushed them together as if they appeared uh, together and were best of friends. They had never really met each other. They didn't appear together at all. That's a faked photo. Another one uh, more recent, this appeared in a British tabloid uh, and the story was about a, a poor child, presumably this one, a Christian girl who was given to Muslim foster parents, foster Muslims, uh, if you will, and she was forced to give up her crucifix, couldn't eat bacon, uh, and had to deal with this uh, rather formidable looking burqa wearing woman. Well, she wasn't wearing a burqa. Uh, at all, and uh, that was photoshopped in. And as a matter of fact, the photo wasn't even taken in England. It was uh, taken in the in the Middle East. That was their daughter. That wasn't the girl uh, at all. And as it turned out, the girl who was given to foster care could keep her crucifix. She could eat bacon. She could. Uh, uh, celebrate Christmas and and Easter, but it's easy to to fake out. I'll be a professor here for a minute and just give you the kind of standard five ways to to uh, spot fake news. So uh, some of you students can report back to your professors. Yeah, I I I learned something. Mm -hmm. Five ways to spot fake news. Uh, it's the usual stuff. You look for the URLs, where are they really coming from? Look at low quality, although that's not such a good one nowadays. And nowadays, fake news sites look even better than a lot of mainstream uh, news sites. So that one might not be quite that useful. Uh, you know, always look at the About Us or the sitemap section. It can, uh, it can reveal some very interesting things. And then, of course, there are good uh, sites like Snopes 
and uh, even Wikipedia, although we professors always tell students don't rely on Wikipedia, uh, there's, there's truth that can be found there. And uh, is this the only source that's reporting it? And then finally, uh, you know, are you just massaging your own prejudices with this story? Are you just looking for things that kind of confirm your beliefs and don't challenge them? And if you were really paying attention, you'd know that was six things, not, not five. So what about journalism? Now we get to, uh, I've given you a little context of where I come from, both my generation personally. Uh, in some ways, I look at myself as a recovering journalist, like I'm in a 12-step program on step eight. I'm making amends uh, to everyone I might have offended. But I'm still a great defender of journalism. I believe that it's extremely uh, important. Thomas Jefferson, you know, said that, uh, hey, you got a choice, government without newspapers, a newspaper without governments. Uh, the, new, the newspaper without governments is definitely to be preferred because he realized you needed a source of information in order for democracy to exist because democracy is us. Democracy isn't them out there, democracy is us. And how are we going to make informed decisions unless we have sources of information that are more than 48 characters long? We need journalism. Although I also have to admit, Thomas Jefferson said, the man who reads nothing is better educated than the man who only reads newspapers. So he, he was on both sides of that particular fence. This is probably my, uh, my favorite one, and I think Jane Flores will agree with this, that uh, journalism will keep you, but uh, it will kill you, but it'll keep you alive while you're at it. Uh, it can be a lot of fun. So the purpose of journalism is we need to provide citizens with the information they need to make those decisions about their, about their life. There's a lot of information out there, but one of the greatest analogies is it's like trying to take a drink of water from a fire hose. There's just too much of it. How do you separate it? How do you filter it? How do you weigh it? You know, most of your jobs, I'm speaking to your students now, you're not going to be manufacturing anything. You're not going to be working with your hands. Probably very few of you are going to be planting anything, unless it's medical marijuana which case that's okay, I, I'm, I'm all for it. But your career is going to be information based. Your career is gonna be based on your ability to take in information from varied sources, to analyze that information, to break it down, to compile that information in the most easily digestible format, either for your bosses, your superiors, or for a public, if you're, if you're a journalist, to repurpose that information, to retransmit that information. That's what contemporary careers are. They're all information-based. So we need that solid base of edited information. We need responsible people to take a look at that information and tell us, okay, you've got this side, you've got that side, you can decide. The first obligation of journalism should be to the truth. Now, we can argue till December on what's the truth and whether there's a capital T truth or a lot of little t truths and your truth isn't my truth and my identity isn't your identity. But there are some things that we can pretty much agree on. And those are the things that we, that we see as more fundamental truths. And one of the purposes of journalism is to hew very closely to those fundamental truths. And the first loyalty is not to advertisers, is not to government, but to the citizens. We exist for the citizens 
and not even the audience. I don't even like the, the word audience. Uh, readers, well, we don't always get our news from reading. Sometimes it's, it's uh, from television or from other sources. But the purpose is not to entertain the citizenry, not to um, amuse us to death, but to inform. And the essence is a discipline of verification. That's, that's what it's about. Get it first, but first get it right. I can't remember which journalist said that, but every journalist says it. So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't really matter. Get it first, because that's the competitive edge, but first get it right. It has to be verified, first of all. And when does journalism really get in trouble? When it doesn't verify. And there certainly have been cases of unverified reports that go out and journalism catches hell for it, and they should. There's, there's no doubt about that. But essentially, it is a career, it is an occupation, it is an institution of verification. Because who are you going to believe? Who else are you, are you going to believe? Who else are you going to trust? Court? Ah, you don't get the truth from court. You get adversarial sides. You get two sides saying, you know, this is what happened, this is what didn't. That's the, judge, the, the job of the judge and jury. Which side better approximates what might be the truth? And, of course, the, impor the, the role of the courts is justice, not necessarily truth. From the church, well, yeah, but you'll get the church version of truth. There's a difference between the Catholic version of truth and the Mormon version of truth and the Jewish version of truth and the Muslim version of truth. So where do we go if we want just kind of a general conception of truth? Is it going to rain? Is it not going to rain? Are we going to go to war or are we not going to go to war? Should we invest? Should we save? What should we do? Where do we get this information to make those key decisions uh, in life? And it serves as an independent monitor of power. It's a forum for criticism. It's a way for, to give a voice to the voiceless. And it's empowerment. Journalism at its best takes information from those who would keep it to themselves because it increases their power and redistributes it to those it can give power to. Who said that? Was that Karl Marx who talked about that? No, nah, it was the other guy with a, with a beard from his past. You all know what fault lines are? You know, with tectonic plates, they come together, great friction, they clash, they make great earthquakes. That's what brought me to Guam, by the way, was the great Alaskan earthquake of 1964, because I had planned, I graduated high school in Anchorage, Alaska. I was going to go to this new campus of the University of Alaska at Anchorage. Anchorage crumbled from the earthquake. My dad was coming to Guam to be the USO director at, back in the Hoover Park days, and he said, well, why don't you come? You can spend a year here. They got a college. You can go there. And that year became four, and then it became five, and then it became 10, and here I am back again. But fault lines, anyway. What are some of the fault lines in society? What are the, some of the things that not only separate us, but provide these clashes? And where should journalism focus to try to bridge these fault lines rather than make them worse? Race and ethnicity, probably one of the greatest fault lines that still exists in society today. How do we bridge that? Gender is a fault line. You know, things just, they're still not the same. It's still that 84 cents uh, versus a dollar. Social class, economic class, education, geography, is uh, definitely a fault line, the north and the south. Big differences uh, uh, between the two. As I like to say in, in Hawaii, all the Ks are not, uh, are not equal. Kahala, which is the 
very ritzy section, is not the same as Kahuku, which is a very poor neighborhood on the, on the North Shore. Where you're from makes a difference. And there are generational uh, differences as well. And I tried to bridge some of those generational differences with my, with my context. We have to add in here now uh, religion to, to race and ethnicity. It has now become a big fault line in our society. We have to add gender identity, not just gender. It's, it's no more just uh, binomial. And we certainly have to add citizenship status to geography, another thing that is separating us. Another little uh, uh, pause there, I'm going to shift gears, because I want to talk about another story that I've been observing from a distance, and that's this whole North Korea Guam business. <laughs> you know, from an outside observer, sitting in Hawaii reading the, the PDN online and, and KUAM, I thought, wow, Guam went through about three or four image stages during this. The first image was, yeah, yeah, North Korea. We hear this crap all the time. Yeah, yeah, life, life is normal. And then all of a sudden, it struck people, you know, geez, this could affect the economy. Uh, 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 tourism. So then we hear, you know, oh, thank you, Uncle Donald, you know, we love you, you're taking care of us, and your tourism is going to grow tenfold, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then others uh, picked it up, and I think your president uh, is one of them, and one of your professors is another, of uh, say, what does all this mean? What does this mean to the identity of Guam to the, uh, to the Chamorro identity. And are we really the tip of somebody's spear? Are we merely a means to an end, to someone else's end? And one thing I love about that, of course, this is an image that's been used to represent Guam. That's not Guam. <laughs> but it's a nice image anyway. That kind of looks like a little tip. So we have to ask ourselves, what kind of stories are out there? Is it just two overly militaristic guys with bad haircuts? Or is there something that we can learn from each other? Are there things going on with the people of North Korea that we don't know about? What would happen if the people of North Korea could see images of Guam? of Chamorro Guam, of everyday Guam, and not just the bombers that are taking off from, from Anderson. What if we could show films to each other? Comrade Kim Goes Flying is a great film, by the way. It's the first North Korean uh, kind of rom-com film. It's available. You can, you can uh, get it from Vimeo, I think, Vimeo or, or uh, Hulu. And what if we were able to send some films to North Korea? Well, actually, that's something that I proposed to my friends, the Munya brothers, at the Guam International Film Festival. And they thought, that is a fantastic idea. Unfortunately, like most of my ideas, they, it came a little late in the game uh, to schedule for this year's film festival. But look to next year. Maybe we can have an exchange a cultural exchange, a people-to-people -people exchange, soft diplomacy through film stories. And what can we learn? What can they learn? Because maybe our differences aren't quite that great. Maybe we're all people who are looking for an identity, who are looking for a future, who are looking for hope in the future. And that's a great, great reason to tell stories. And I got to throw in a plug, because as Dr. Underwood said, I'm here for the Guam International Film Festival. Starts tomorrow night at the uh, Guam Museum. We're going to have a panel discussion right here on campus Friday at uh, 10 o'clock over in the, uh, the PubAd uh, 
uh, building where we'll have two visiting filmmakers as well. So GIF will come to uh, UOG and we certainly hope that you will uh, come to GIF as well because films are about telling stories. And so I'm going to ask you, what's your story? What's you come from a storytelling culture, just as I do. You have stories to tell. What are they? If you had the opportunity to tell those stories, what would they be? Because I got to warn you, if you don't tell your own story, the story will be told to you, for you, about you, and it's not going to have anything to do with you. Let me give you an example. This is uh, from Blue Crush, surfing uh, story about Hawaii. Uh, what's up? Do you know those guys? Yeah, I do. We gotta go. Really? Yeah. Prepare to get vibed. This place is kaboom. I mean, not limited to you, Holly. This is a local spot. What's up with this yeah, Holly? Yeah, I'm a local. He's not. What's up, Holly Here's boy? Here's back off. We grew I'm here. Missing, guys. You flew here. It's not his fault. Yeah, what are you doing here. on our beach, Holly boy? You don't live here? You don't serve here. We'll be out of here in like five this seconds. This is a local spot. Hey, this we place is for the boys. This guy over here, Anne-Marie. What's up with that? Why don't you just relax, brah? Brah? Drew? What you telling me, brah? From here, Drew, donkey. stop it. What's up? You want some of this? Drew, stop it. Stop it. Okay. Don't touch her. Drew, gonna grow up. I got his wallet. We're out of here. Let's go serve. Stop, 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 stop. Drew, stop. I'm not lying to you to protect you, Holly Just boy. Stop it. Seriously, stop it. Walk away. Seriously, stop it. Why are you being like this? Don't touch her. Don't touch her. What are you going to do? Get down. Get down. Come on, Drew. Get down. 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 Get Get in the car. Stop it. Get in the car. Just get in the car. What? Walk away. You're an asshole. I do what I do best. Relax, bro. Kick his ass. What? Kick his ass. You. Kick his ass. Nice meeting you guys. Go back to the main line. There is an unfortunate cultural history of films about Hawaii where basically locals are thugs, uh, males are either huge, uh, great food consumers, women are uh, exotic, erotic, and the hero of every story is the imported Howley who comes and solves everybody's problem. You don't want that to happen in Guam films, and the only way you're going to keep that from happening is to tell your stories. Here's some other choices that uh, you can make. You know, hula is, uh, is next to sacred in, in Hawaii. Uh, so you can have... So the choice is yours. We do become the stories we tell. That we watch these stories, we don't see ourselves, or we see ourselves only as negative portrayals. That's what we become. And I know that Guam is undergoing a decolonization effort, and that's part of it, is to recognize how we have been portrayed in the media. And the answer to it is to create our own, make our own stories. Well, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, that's my story. I hope you've uh, enjoyed it somewhat. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the opportunity to spend this time with you. And I'm, and I'm happy. Uh, 
happy to take questions or make comments or sing a song. Before we uh, get any questions from the audience, I do want to recognize the presence of Regent Mariflor Herrero, who was in the audience today. How about a round of applause for Regent Herrero? What do you tell students today um, about where they get their news, about from the internet, where they get their news from, and how important it is, the source? Well. I have nothing against uh, getting the news from, from the internet. What I would do is suggest, uh, find out what source they're looking at, and suggest some others that they could look at uh, very easily, and make use of news aggregators, that you can create your own news aggregator. And if you enjoy just getting news from one source, you can add another source or a third source uh, to that as well. You can add the, the Guardian uh, from UK, you can add Washington Post, you can add uh, Minneapolis uh, Star Tribune, uh, whatever, whatever you like. So um, I, I would certainly advise against relying uh, only on Twitter and, and tweets and, and retweets, because again, to quote uh, the Reverend Jackson, this is text without context. So it is indeed purely pretext. Unless it's, you know, Justin Bieber, then it's, then it's okay. We have a question here from Dr. Galabi. Oh, uh, thank you, thank you for a very interesting topic and, and presentation. Um, one thing that I have learned from the news media presentations, whether that is in the TV or radio, or even sometimes newspapers, although I found newspapers are a little bit more honest than TV uh, newspapers and um, TV uh, um, uh, news and radio, and that is that they exaggerate a lot they talk to one person, and then they uh, present that as a news or as an event that is happening in a nation. And uh, so how that, I mean, when these people go to a school, like if you go to medical school, they, before you graduate, they make you to swear or, or go to oath say that you only will work for the health of people to, to make, you know. Uh, but in news uh, colleges, or uh, don't they have to take an oath, say that they should say the truth? Because a lot of times, like I said, they may, they may think they are telling the truth, or they may present, behave like they are telling the truth, but they exaggerate and events so much that uh, you know they make everybody believe uh, that that's what is happening uh, with you know uh, in a nation rather than just talking to one person. Well, I I certainly hope colleges teach young journalists uh, a system of ethics. There are certainly many codes of ethics out there that would cover. Uh, what you were just describing. Uh, it's a sin I, I normally refer to as the cross-section of one, of talking to one person and then trying to uh, make that seem like it represents much more than, than it is. We would often uh, see that in, in journalists that would go to a foreign country and you'd, the first story they would always write would be based on the cab driver they talk to on the way from the airport uh, uh, to, their, to their hotel. But, uh, you know, one person's exaggeration uh, is another person's focus. Uh, in, in my experience, uh, and there is, there's bad journalism out there. I will, I will not say that it's all good because, for one thing, 
A doctor has to be licensed. A doctor has to receive a medical degree from a certified university, has to pass a license, and has to and belongs to an organization where there is the power to remove that license. Not true in journalists. You don't need any education. I became a journalist without ever taking a journalism uh, uh, course, as a matter of fact. That all came later. It was I kind of put the the horse uh, behind the behind the cart and learned on the job. Uh, there's no licensing of a, a journalist. My daughter, who uh, cuts hair, has to have a license. And she can have her license taken away from her if she uh, does a bad job or doesn't clean her scissors or whatever, whatever else. But journalists can't lose their, their license. The only uh, sanction uh, that there is is, is direct complaints through letters to the editor or or comments on the website to abandon that particular uh, news source uh, but I think we could probably sit down and talk about specific examples of where things have have been exaggerated but as a as a general rule most news agencies uh, do try to avoid that. And I'll admit, I'm, I'm a bit of an antediluvian here in that this is, the, this is the journalism I knew and loved. And I realize it's a much different market today. And uh, as, as Dr. Underwood and I were talking about uh, earlier today, it's easy to just say something, may not be true, and yeah, so what? People go, yeah, yeah, well. That's just that person, or that's just that that news agency. That's Fox. That's CNN. You know, but a lot of it depends. You know, if you're pro CNN and anti Fox, or pro Fox or anti CNN, that's again just more massaging your prejudices than it is uh, looking at at multiple sources. Because the answer to bad speech is not restriction. The ad, the answer to bad speech is more speech because the truth will eventually rise. Thomas Jefferson said that. Actually, John Milton said it. Thomas Jefferson repeated it. We have a question over here. Hey there, sir. Um, you know your presentation, right? You said it consists of stories and life lessons, right? I'm kind of curious, though. What was the greatest moral lesson that you've learned throughout your life? And why do you feel that way? Can I answer that by telling you a story? <laughs> I'll give you a moral conundrum I had. And I, th I think this can be faced by many people in many different situations. This just happened. In, in journalism. Um, and this happened in, in Hawaii. Had a ex I was an editor, had an excellent reporter who knew how to read financial statements and bank statements. And she came to me and she said, you know, there's this savings and loan company that's going to go belly up. And I said, how do you know that? I can read it from their financial statements. They have got too many loans out, too many bad real estate investments that they're not going to be able to make. As you know, banks don't have all your money. If we all went down to the bank and asked for our money, they don't have it. They've got it out there invested. And so we went to the, to the publisher and said, you know, we got this this story is pretty good. And he said, oh, gosh, you know, what's going to happen, though, if we run that story, it's going to be, uh, it's, it's going it's to happen. There will be a run on the bank. People will lose confidence, and it will go under. So we interview the savings and loan, and they said, you know, we've got this uh, white knight coming, former secretary of the treasury. He's going to infuse 
all kinds of money to cover these loans. Basically, they invested in this real estate, and then we had a volcanic eruption on the Big Island, and it was all covered in lava, so they couldn't sell the land. No one could build a house on it. So we decided, okay, we'll give you, we'll give you one working week. We'll give you five days, and if this doesn't happen, we're going to go with the story. Because they also said, you know, if you run the story, this white knight on the horse is going to turn around and gallop away and go someplace else, and we will go under, and people will lose their money. Because we'd had these, these savings and loans that had gone out of business, and it was terrible. People lose their life savings. So we thought that was a good compromise decision. And sure enough, it happened. The former secretary of the treasury comes in, puts a lot of money in. That savings and loan later became a bank, later joined Bank of America. But after it reached solvency, I said to my then fiance, you know, you're really lucky because you've got all your money in this savings and loan and they were just on the brink of going out of business and you would have lost all your savings. And she looked at me and said, and you didn't tell me? You didn't warn me? And I hitched up my journalism ethics pants and I said, whoa, sounding like Nancy Drew in the film clip. Well, you know, a good journalist has to keep the confidence of the sources. And if I told you, I would have to tell him, and I would have to tell her, and I would have to tell everybody. I can't just pick and choose who I tell and who I don't. And she said, uh-huh. I didn't hear from her for several days. And then I got a phone call. And she said, what if it was your money? Would you have taken your money out? Or would you have left it in with the rest of us suckers? And then hung up. And I thought, oh, lordy me. This is going to be a rough one. And then I got a call from her and she said, what if it was your mother's money? Because <clears throat> my mother was now passed, but she was a saint. But sure enough, in the little community she lived in, all of her savings were in one bank. And I would always say, Mom, you got to diversify. You can't keep it all in one place. She said, but they're so nice there. They're so nice when I go in. And I, boy, that really stopped me. Would I have slipped my mother that information? Because there's no way she could have just lived on Social Security. I mean, that would have just, that would have wiped her out completely. So I don't have an answer to that. It is still a moral conundrum. And hindsight is always 2020. What would happen if it, what would I have done if I could go back in time and it, and it happened again? Well, the, the happy ending is, is my then fiance is, is now my wife because you've you got to hold on to someone like that who's going who's gonna to hold your feet to the fire on, uh, on all of these questions. And believe me, she continues uh, uh, to do so. But what do you do when, you're, when you're self interest, because we are all driven by self interest, there's no doubt about that, when your self interest competes with your professional interests? And I don't know if it's a moral lesson uh, that, that I've learned. It's a moral lesson that I still consider constantly. I, I hope that's good enough to, to uh, answer your question. The other thing I bring with me is what my father always told me, which is cheap don't last. And uh, I always pass that on to, to anyone else. You know, it may be cheap, but it's, it's not going to last. Go for the gold. Okay, one last question for Dr. Brislin. 
Okay, so no uh, further questions. We would like to uh, ask Dr. Underwood to make a very special presentation to Dr. Brislin. Well, Tom, as always, uh, you, 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 your uh, sense of humor and your uh, flexibility, your, your mental agility is uh, uh, very uh, inspiring. So on behalf of the University of Guam, uh, you are, in fact, the 32nd uh, presidential lecture. So I'm happy to present this to you. Oh, <laughs> go for the goal. <laughs>